happy happy to be here it's actually quite an honor and i think this is a wonderful conference that the that the council's put together and and like the other speakers i'm i'm happy to meet meet people i as tanya said my particular take on the issue of database expansion has to do with the risk of error and it's it's obviously one of many issues but i think it's an important issue and one that's that's been overlooked uh i feel i've been writing about the potential for error in dna testing for some time and i often feel like i'm kind of a voice crying in the wilderness i mean it seems like um i i'm in a kind of unique position i think i i spend a lot of time looking at DNA evidence you know, with kind of a critical eye to see what's wrong with it and and you know I, I just don't think there are that many people out there other than people who are practitioners of DNA testing who are presenting it themselves who who you know have followed it closely enough to get an idea of what can go wrong with it and 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 I'm certainly not suggesting that DNA in general is unreliable I'm mean, quite the contrary I think that DNA testing when done properly and carefully can be extraordinarily uh, convincing I you know I have no questions at all about the reliability of the of the innocence project's DNA exonerations I mean those cases are proved six ways to Sunday I mean that there uh, but uh, when you look at cases you find problems and and uh, the problems although not occurring in every case occur often enough that I think we need to think about them when we talk about uh, uh, what could happen through a dramatic expansion of government databases so that's what I'll focus on and and I, I think of it as you know what's uh, as, as defining the risk now uh, certainly a lot of speakers have alluded to the basic rhetoric that surrounds DNA evidence it goes like this I mean, DNA profiles are essentially unique uh, the tests are infallible they either produce the right result or no result and if you don't believe you know the New York's highest Court of Appeal says so so it must be true um, uh, therefore, ergo, innocent people have nothing to fear from being included in a DNA database, you know. The risk to you is zero unless, of course, you commit a crime and therefore, you know, what's, what's the problem here? And that's the, that's the argument that, that uh, we're up against when we want to raise concerns or suggest a, a note of caution about database expansion. Um, the fact is the rhetoric of infallibility is wrong false DNA matches can occur they have occurred um, through a number of ways uh, coincidental matches have occurred uh, there can be matches due to uh, simple error uh, of a number of kinds the most common kind of error that has produced false cold hits is cross-contamination of samples in, in the laboratory and we know of a number of those um, misinterpretation of test results has caused some false uh, a number of number of it's caused some false convictions and it's caused uh, you know at least a couple of false cold hits uh, mislabeling of samples is a continuing problem um, the the final area that that, uh, that I'll mention uh, if we have time is is the potential for frame ups and planting which I think has not been discussed uh, enough either I mean if somebody if somebody takes my you know my DNA from my you know shed hair or my discarded condom and decides to to, to plant it uh, at a crime scene um, I mean that if, if I'm not in the database it you know, it doesn't really affect me very much it may throw the police off the trail of the true perpetrator because they have this unknown DNA profile there but I don't have anything to worry about if I'm not in the database if I'm in the database however and somebody takes some of my DNA and sprinkles it around um, then I'm in big trouble potentially um, and I think that you know I, if there's a CSI effect uh, my colleague Simon Cole has written a nice piece in the New England uh, Law Review questioning what the, wh whether there is a CSI effect and, and, and what it means but if there is a CSI effect it might in part mean that that criminals too are thinking about uh, about these issues so we'll, we'll come to that at the end um, so let me uh, start by trying to clarify a few issues about database matches and I got um, on the draft of my paper in the materials I, I got some uh, very helpful comments from from uh, Tanya and Shelley and I actually have done a revised version that says a lot more about coincidence that I can send you those of you who are interested uh, I say a lot more about that and some more about uh, familial searches but but you know these are kind of the questions that that 
prosecutors everywhere you know and legislators in most places are asking you know if there's, if there's a match and it's a one in a hundred billion how could the person possibly be innocent you know if it's you know, that doesn't sound like a very a big risk if it's one in a billion so what what is the risk and um, one one problem is the the birthday problem which is that the, the frequency of the profile is not necessarily the same as the probability that you'll find a duplication in some population. And this, this is, is the issue that comes up uh, in, in uh, Troy Duster's comments about the Arizona database matches and why that surprised people. And let, let's think about it this way. There's a famous problem in statistics called the birthday problem, which is that you know, the probability any two people will share a birthday, like the probability that you know, Tanya and I will have the same birthday is about one in 300 165 because there are 365 different different days and so the you know the probability of a matching birthday then sounds like it's pretty low but the probability any two people in a room will happen to share a birthday I'm not saying who they are in advance is really much higher there's a very high I'd bet anybody any amount you know I'd bet anybody any amount of money that, we'll, that there are two people in this room that have the same birthday I mean, you know, because it, it's the pro the pro that probability is greater than one half when there when the number of people in the room exceeds 22, and if the number of people in the room approaches 60, which I think we're we're pushing, the number is basically it's a virtual lock, right? And why is that? Because everybody in the room is compared to every other person. So you know, Tanya has you know, there's 60 people in the room. Tanya has 60 chances to match. I have 60 chances to match. Steve has 60 chances to match. All right, so, so there are many, many, many different comparisons that are being made, and therefore many, many more chances to match. And so even if you have a DNA profile that's found in, in one in a billion people, uh, if that's the average frequency of the profile, if you're comparing trillions of different pairs of people, you're going to find some matches. Um, let's you know, look at, look at uh, I mean, you can compute it this way. Like suppose the probability of a random match between any two DNA profiles is between one in 10 billion and one in a trillion, which is you know, about the numbers that you might see associated with a 13 locus uh, profile. What's the probability of finding a match between two such profiles in a database of varying size. And I'll, the sizes I'll give are 1,000, 100,000, and a million. Just this is for comparison. Right? And you can compute this. If you want to know how to compute it, just Google the term birthday problem, and you'll see some statistical formulas which will allow you to do it. When, you know, getting, get, doing it for the big databases is hard because you need substantial computing power. But it can be done, and I did it as an exercise uh, a, a while back. And here's what I found, all right? So, so here's the size of the database. We've got a database of 1,000 people, 10,000 people, or 100,000, 100, or a million, okay? So different sizes. These are the profile frequencies. And so what's the likelihood that two profiles in a DNA database will match, all right? Well, you know, let's take the one in 10 billion profile. If, if among 1,000 people, there's only one chance in 20,000 of finding a match. But if it's 10,000 people, one in 200. 100,000 people, one chance in 2.5 of finding a match. Uh, a million people, it's a lock. You're going to find one. You know, it's you know 99.999. Okay. Um, now, as the as the profiles become rarer, you know the numbers go down. But even if you have a profile of a number of one in a trillion, if you have a database of a million people, yeah, you know, there's a chance of about one in 2.5 of finding one. Right. So what does that mean? We've got what's the CODIS database is now pushing six million. So are we going to, you know, are there matching DNA profiles from different people in there? Sure, there are. We might not have found them or realized that that uh, that they are are from different people yet, but it's a statistical necessity that there will be some matches. Now. Uh, <laughs> The other side of the coin is that there aren't going to be that many. I mean, in, in CODIS, if, if there's a, there may be a handful of 13 locus matches from different people, so that you could argue that doesn't really threaten the, you know, the the, the DNA testing enterprise. But it's it's something to take into account, particularly when we're t when we're talking about more common uh, profiles. That there you know, could be there could be uh, quite a few of these of these matches. Uh, and this sort of thing, I think, explains, in part, it explains the Arizona data. The, 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 um, if, you, if you do the birthday statistics on the Arizona problem, the, predict, the, the predicted number of, of 9 out of 13 locus matches is something around 90 to 100. Right? And, and in fact, they found 127, or 130, something like that. So they found, they found more 
than would have been predicted. And the question then is, is it so much more that it, it's statistically significant in a way that would rule out the hypothesis of statistical independence that underlies our, our statistical computations? And you know, I, I, as I point out in the paper, opinions on that, on that vary uh, somewhat. It's certainly the Arizona data certainly suggests that we need to be need to look into these issues of statistical independence more carefully than we have, and, and opening up governmental uh, offender databases for statistical study would be one way of doing that, right, that I think should, should be done. But uh, I don't think anybody thinks that it fundamentally undermines the statistics so much that, that you know, the statistic that's presented as one in a billion might really be one in a hundred. I mean, nobody thinks that could be true. Everybody agrees these things are rare. Now, a more serious problem than the birthday problem is the problem of uh, partial uh, profile matches. Uh, this fellow is a guy named John Puckett who was convicted of uh, rape and murder in San Francisco in February, another one of Vicka Barlow's uh, clients. Here he is with one of his uh, uh, other lawyers, um, Maloof, I think is his name, uh, during the trial. Uh, Puckett was, uh, the, 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 the murder was, uh, that he uh, was accused of committing occurred in 1972. And um, he was identified through a, a cold hit. This was a very cold hit. So years, years later, uh, DNA was extracted from this old cold case from 1972. Uh, the, the, an, an oral swab from the, from the woman's mouth was typed. And there were traces of spermatozoa. A partial profile was developed. Uh, the estimated frequency by the lab was one in one, one in 1.1 1 .1, uh, million. Okay, not billions or trillions here. Now we're talking millions. This was searched through a California offender database, which at the time had over 300,000 people in it. Right, and um, a pucket uh, popped up as a match. He was in the database because he had been convicted earlier of uh, of a rape. In the, er, back in the 70s, 1977, I think he had some, some rape, uh, rape and sexual assault convictions. He'd been out of prison since uh, mid-80s with, no uh, with no further criminal record. Uh, so he was, he was put on trial. And that, I mean, this, is, this is the kind of case, I think, that, that realistically we need to look closely at. Um, you know, a, a profile frequency of 1 in 1.1 million I mean, in a, in a country of 300 million people, uh, we're going to have you know, over 300 of these. So how do we know that this guy is the guilty guy rather than one of the other 290 some people? Well, um, you know, because, he's, because he has a prior record for rape, well, you know, and most people in the offender database who are going to be matched, if it's an offender database, will have a prior record for something, right? So, so I mean, that hard, uh, you know, that's, not, that's not terribly convincing. I mean, he. He did live in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time of the crime. I mean, he was like within driving distance of where the crime occurred in 1972. On the other hand, I was thinking about this. So was I, actually. But, uh, but you know, but that, that was the only that was the only evidence against him, right? So it's it's a uh, so the probability. I think the probability of, of of falsely linking somebody to a crime in a case like this is uh, uh, through a database search is it could be could be very high. Um, and then, then this then raises the issue of how do we explain this to the jury. And the Puckett case is, a, is an excellent example of how not to do it, I think. The jury was not told that the DNA identification came from a database match. They were not told anything about the size of the data database. They were simply told, it's a DNA match, folks, one in 1.1 1 .1 million. You know, and as I, as I argue in the article, I think that a, a jury could reasonably have concluded that there's one chance in a million that there was a coincidence here. When in fact, I think the probability of a coincidence may be quite high. I mean, you know, you know the probability of finding somebody even in the California database. Uh, if everybody in the California database was innocent and they searched for a one in 1.1 million profile, you'd expect to find, you know, there's about a, you know, one chance in three of finding somebody by chance, even if they were all innocent. So this, this is a, this I think is an extremely weak case that when it was presented to the jury had the appearance of being a strong case, at least strong enough to have this man convicted of, of uh, murder. Okay, and looking more closely at it, um, if you look closely at it, there are, there are further issues. I mean, partly because this is a partial profile, there are issues of interpretation here and a mixture. So here's 
this is the thirteen locus profile of mr puckett here on the on the top line this